Just before we get into today's video, a word from our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one website platform for anyone looking to stand out and succeed online. Whether you're a budding entrepreneur or managing a booming brand, Squarespace is here to make your online life easy. Squarespace offers a ton of fantastic features, and the standard for me has to be Fluid Engine. It's like a magic wand for web design. You start with a template, and then you sprinkle it with your creativity, reimagined through drag and drop technology. Voila, your website dreams come true. Whether you're on desktop or mobile. Plus, the flexible website templates are the perfect outfit for your website. Start with a pro template, customize it, add any features you want, and you're good to go. And Squarespace just dropped courses. You can now create and sell your courses online. Start with a pro layout, upload videos, customize it with Fluid Engine, and set your price. Turn your knowledge into income with Squarespace courses. So here's the deal. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch your online empire, go to squarespace.com slash brainfood to save a sweet 10% off your first purchase of a domain or website using the promo code brain food and now today's video in the middle of the south pacific 3500 kilometers off the coast of chile lies one of the most isolated specks of land on the planet easter island a mere 163 kilometers square the island is covered in extinct volcanic craters and rugged grassy hills but what makes easter island famous the world over are uh, not for its natural wonders but rather for its man-made ones the giant humanoid stone sculptures known as the moai with their long heads giant noses and prominent brows and chins these statues have become emblematic of easter islands and the polynesian culture as a whole but while the moai are impressive achievements which continue to baffle archaeologists their legacy is a tragic one for their construction 600 years ago is thought to have driven the Easter Islanders to overexploit their island's natural resources, resulting in environmental collapse and the downfall of their civilization. But is this actually true? Were the Easter Islanders' impressive construction projects really their undoing, and does this disaster serve as a poignant warning of the dangers of environmental degradation? Well, let's find out as we dive into the history of Polynesia's most mysterious island. Now, the first Europeans to visit Easter Island was Dutch explorer Jacob Roggeveen, who shortly after his arrival in 1722 wrote in his ship's log, the people had, to judge by appearances, no weapons. Although, as I remarked, they relied, in case of need, on their gods or idols, which stand erected all along the seashore in great numbers, before which they fall down and invoke them. These idols were all hewn out of stone and in the form of a man with long ears adorned on the head with a crown, yet all made with skill. Whereat, we wondered not a little. A clear space was reserved around these objects of worship by laying stones to a distance of 20 or 30 paces. I took some of the people to be priests because they paid more reverence to the gods than the rest did and showed themselves much more devout in their ministrations. One could also distinguish these from the other people quite well, not only by their wearing great white plugs in their earlobes, but in having the head wholly shaven and hairless. Roggeveen and his crew named their discovery Pash Island, or Easter Island, after the day of their arrival, but to its indigenous inhabitants, the island is known as Rapa Noi, a name also applied to the inhabitants themselves. Other traditional names of the island include Tepeto, or Henoa, the navel of the world, and Mata Kitarangi, or eyes looking to the sky. The first people are believed to have arrived on Rapa Nui from eastern Polynesia between 600 and 800 CE. In the 1940s, Norwegian ethnographer Thor Heyerdahl proposed an alternate theory that the Rapa Nui had instead come from the eastern coast of South America and in 1947 built a wooden raft called Kondigi and sailed it from Peru to the Taumoto Islands to prove that ancient peoples could have made such a journey. Since then, however, Heyerdahl's theory has been widely rejected by the anthropological community, with nearly all archaeological and ethnographic evidence pointing to a Polynesian rather than South American origin for the Rapanoian culture. As was common across Polynesia, Rapanoi society was organized around an aristocracy of ranked hereditary chiefs or Araki, who were believed to be directly descended from the gods and to possess supernatural powers or manner. It was these chiefs, both living and deceased, which the Moai were erected to honor. Though commonly referred to as the Easter Island heads, Moai are actually full-body statues, but their bodies are considerably smaller and less detailed than their heads, with stubby arms and no legs. However, erosion has covered up most of the bodies in soil, causing the Moai to look like giant disembodied heads sticking out of the hillsides. When originally constructed, Moai were erected on elevated ceremonial platforms called Aua, built around the outer perimeter of Rapa Noi, with the statues facing inland so the spirits of the ancestors they embodied could keep watch over the island's inhabitants. The majority of the nearly 1,000 moai erected around Rapa Nui are carved from tuff, a soft, porous stone made of compacted volcanic ash, though at least 14 are carved from harder, denser basalt. 
The average Moai stands at 4 meters tall and weighs 3 to 5 tons, though the largest stands at 11 meters tall and weighs a whopping 80 tons. Some sport hat-like cylinders called pukau, made of red scoria stone, which are thought to represent ceremonial headdresses or hairstyles. As mana was thought to be stored in the hair, Ariki never cut the hair, instead arranging it into elaborate top knots. Moai also originally featured realistic-looking eyes fashioned from white coral and obsidian volcanic glass, though most of these have since disappeared. Each Moai was sponsored by a different individual or group and carved at a single quarry within the crater of the extinct Rana Raraku volcano. Under the supervision of a master sculptor, a team of around 15 craftsmen carved the Moai from the crater wall using harder basalt chisels called toki. The statues were carved lying on their backs, with a thin spine of stone being left underneath to support the Moai while its front and sides were polished. The spine was then broken, the statue slid to the bottom of the crater and stood upright so that the rest of the carving and polishing could be completed. Many Moai feature elaborate back carvings, mostly related to the indigenous Birdman cult. Every year, chiefs would compete in a series of strength and endurance trials, the winner of which had the honor of representing the creator god, Maka Make, for the following year. As the Birdman cult only emerged after 1400 CE, many of these back carvings are believed to have been added to the Moai long after they were originally carved and erected. Once carving and polishing was complete, next came the daunting task of moving the Moai out of the crater and erecting them on their respective Ahu, which could be up to 10 kilometers away from the quarry. How exactly this was accomplished has been the subject of considerable debate for centuries. Initially, it was assumed that the statues were transported on their backs and only raised at arrival at the Ahu. However, of the many Moai that fell during transportation and were abandoned, around half are lying on their stomach and half on their back, indicating that they were in fact transported upright. The most commonly accepted theory is that the Moai were lashed to some sort of wooden frame or sledge, which was then rolled on logs. In 1987, American archaeologist Charles Love tried this technique on a nine-ton Moai replica and found it to be surprisingly efficient, the statue requiring only 25 people to move 40 meters in two minutes. However, according to oral history, the Moai didn't need to be dragged. Instead, they were bewitched by chiefs with powerful manner and walked themselves from the quarry to the Ahu. While at first this was dismissed as a fanciful legend, the fact that the bottoms of the Moai are rounded rather than flat led some archaeologists to wonder whether this story might actually be partially based in truth. In 1986, our old friend Thor Heyerdahl, along with Czech engineer Pavel Pavel, attempted to move a replica Moai by lashing them to the top and making a statue shuffle or walk forward in a twisting motion as one might move a refrigerator. This experiment was repeated in 2012 by American archaeologists Terry Hunt and Carl Lipo, who concluded that while slower than the log roller method, the walking technique was surprisingly efficient and required only 18 people to carry out. Based on these experiments, the largest Moai would have needed around 40 people to carve and move, and around 300 to 400 people to produce the rope, food, and other resources required to complete the project. Only once a Moai was erected atop its Ahu would final details like decorative eyes and pukau headdresses be added. The construction of the Moai is thought to have taken place over three distinctive periods, starting around 700 to 850 CE. These early Moai were more realistic than the latter, more famous statues with more rounded and proportionate features. Very few of these earlier sculptures remain, for during the middle period of around 1050 to 1680 CE, most of them were destroyed to make way for the newer, larger sculptures. This is considered the golden age of Moai construction, during which the different groups of Rapanoi competed to erect ever larger and more impressive sculptures. While the largest Moai to be successfully raised stands at 11 meters tall, one unfinished example found on its back at the Rana Raraku is nearly twice as tall. But this frenzy of construction came at great cost. While the island was once covered in large stands of Toromiro trees and other native vegetation, it was gradually deforested by the Rapanoi to make rollers and other equipment to move and erect the Moai. This in turn made the soil increasingly vulnerable to erosion, leading to a decrease in soil fertility and a sharp decline in agricultural output. Believing their ancestors to be displeased, the Rapanoi built even more of these moai in an effort to appease them, ironically making the problem worse and culminating in the collapse of the island's ecosystem. By the end of the 17th century, Rapanoi society descended into a long period of civil war, during which the construction of moai was abandoned and many of the statues were toppled and destroyed. According to tradition, these wars were fought between two tribal groups known as the Long Ears and the Short Ears the latter of which were all but enslaved by the former. Around 1680 CE, the Short Ears rose up against their masters and all but exterminated them, enslaving the survivors and cannibalizing the dead. 
This conflict, along with constant famine and disease, caused the population of Rapa Nui to decline rapidly from its peak of 20,000. By the time British navigator Captain James Cook visited in 1774, there were only around 700 people living on the island. This gradually increased to around 3,000 by 1860, but following a slave raid launched from Peru in 1862 and a subsequent smallpox epidemic, by 1877 the population was reduced to a mere 111 people. In 1864, a French Catholic missionary named Eugène Erode settled on the island and succeeded in converting the remaining Rapa Nui to Christianity, resulting in the last standing Moai being toppled. In 1870, sheep farming was introduced to the islands, while in 1888 it was formally annexed by Chile. Today, Easter Island is home to around 4,000 native Rapa Nui and Chileans, all of whom live in and around the island's only village, Hangaroa, on the southwest coast. Centuries of overexploitation have also left their mark on the local ecosystem. A recent survey of the island counted only 48 species of native plants, 14 of which were introduced by the original settlers. Aside from chickens and rats also introduced by the Rapa Nui, there are few native vertebrates on the island, with most of the seabirds having moved their nesting areas to safer offshore islands. The tragic self-destruction of the Rapa Nui has long been held up as a potent parable of the dangers of environmental degradation, with University of California professor Jared Diamond writing in his best selling 2005 book Collapse, the parallels between Easter Island and the whole modern world are chillingly obvious. Easter's isolation makes it the clearest example of a society that destroyed itself by overexploiting its own resources. Or is it? While the ecocide theory has held sway in the archaeological community for decades, more recent investigations suggest that the long-accepted version of Easter Island's history might actually be completely wrong. As we've already covered, according to the traditional narrative, the Rapa Nui arrived on Easter Island around between 600 and 800 CE and began carving and erecting Moai no later than 850 CE. Over the next 100 years, the population thrived and steadily increased to a peak of around 20,000, until in the 17th century, deforestation led to a catastrophic environmental and social collapse. However, in 2004, ecologists Andreas Meath and Hans Rudolf Bork of Christian Arbachs University in Kiel, Germany, constructed a new timeline for human occupation and deforestation forestation on Easter Island by studying the remains of campfires and pollen deposited by the island's once abundant Jubea palm trees. To their surprise, they found little evidence of large-scale human inhabitation prior to around 1280 CE. Nor did they find a 800-year gap between the start of human inhabitation and the start of widespread deforestation. In other words, humans arrived on Easter Island far later than archaeologists originally assumed, and the widespread deforestation of the islands began almost as soon as they arrived. But if construction of the Moai didn't reach its peak until 400 years later, what then was responsible for this rapid environmental degradation? Well, the culprit, it appears now, is not the Moai, but rather rats. Along with chicken and several varieties of plants such as sweet potatoes, the first settlers of Easter Islands brought with them the edible ratus exulans or Polynesian rat. These rodents multiply so quickly that within three years a single breeding pair can grow into a population of almost 17 million. Given the abundance of food and the population densities found on similar Pacific islands, Easter Island in its original state could easily have supported a rat population of 3.1 million, or 75 rats per acre. Worse still, Polynesian rats are voracious eaters, feeding on seeds such as those of the endemic Jabea palm. Indeed, not only do nearly all the Jabea seeds excavated on Easter Island show evidence of being gnawed by rats, but rats are believed to be responsible for deforesting large areas of Oahu in Hawaii. By contrast, Nehoa Islands, which rats never reached, retains much of its indigenous vegetation despite having been inhabited by humans for thousands of years. This one-two punch of humans cutting down trees and rats eating their seeds would have led to the rapid deforestation of Easter Island far earlier than was once assumed. Furthermore, analysis of charcoal from the campfires and other evidence suggests that this deforestation did not actually trigger a massive population collapse. In fact, thanks to the environmental degradation brought on by rat-assisted deforestation, it is unlikely that Easter Island could have ever supported a human population of more than 3,000 or so, the same numbers encountered by the first European visitors in the 1700s. Indeed, it was not until after first contact with Europeans that the population of Easter Island began to decline to any significant degree. And even the widespread soil erosion that plagues the island to this day is largely the result of sheep and other livestock introduced by Europeans in the 1870s. Thus, in conclusion, the collapse of Easter Island's environment and its native civilization was brought about not by religious zeal and the self-destructive over-exploitation of the local environment, but by the same forces that destroyed so many other indigenous societies – disease, murder, and displacement at the hands of European colonialism. Today, the 4,000 indigenous Rapa Nui inhabitants of Easter Island are struggling to reclaim their traditional culture and their independence from the Chilean government. 
As part of this cultural reawakening, the Rapanoi have pressured Chile to grant indigenous families small independent homesteads on the island and called for the return of cultural treasures from museums around the world. Among these are several Moai, including a four-ton example nicknamed Hoa Hakananai, or Stolen Friends, taken from Easter Island by the crew of the British frigate HMS Depays in 1869, and currently housed, well, where else other than the British Museum. Easter Island's cultural heritage also faces severe threats closer to home. In March 2020, for example, a Moai was knocked over by a runaway pickup truck, while in October 2022, an arsonist set fire to the island, raising over 600 square kilometers of land and severely damaging several Moai. And the damage caused by such incidents may be even greater than it appears, for new archaeological discoveries are constantly being made all over the island, including a previously unknown 1.6 meter tall moai found in a dried out lake bed in February 2023. In response to these threats, the Chilean government has reduced the number of tourists allowed on Easter Island at any one time and the length of time they visit, though this is merely the first step in preserving the remote island's unique heritage. In the meantime, the enigmatic Moai continue to watch over the descendants of their original creators, descendants whose future, at least for the moment, remains rather uncertain. <laughs>